effort. First thing I'm going to ask, please, is if you wouldn't mind silencing your cell phones. That would be awesome. Thank you very much. So here we are, and thank you to all of you. Most assuredly, thank you to the candidates for joining us this evening. These are uh, always stressful events, but they all look so prepared, and I think that we will all be fascinated fascinated by what they had to say. I am Fran Milo, and I was the person that sort of got the ball rolling, but there are a number of people who have made this happen, and I need to thank every single one of them. Uh, Bill Wilson is the uh, principal for Kessley, and he has been most gracious in helping. Greg Samuelson is uh, our host in the auditorium, and he has been very helpful, and he, in fact, is back in the sound booth. Uh, we have a huge thank you to go to one Mr. Tim Frankie and Doonland Media because this evening's event is going to be videoed and it will be available after, I'm going to say, five to seven days because there's some editing of just smoothing out the rough edges. And uh, thanks to Matt Moore from uh, 96.7 Eagle or Hometown News. Uh, you may be aware of from Facebook or it's also a website. The video will be available for a click so you can spread the word to folks who, want, who couldn't be here tonight and will want to see what uh, we are, uh, what we have online for those folks who wish to be a part of the school board. Uh, so our great thanks to Tim who uh, at the very last minute put that part of things together. It's a huge ask and appreciate it so much. I'd like to thank Gloria Jones, who is down here in the front, and she is our thankless person of keeping the time and saying stop. So she will make herself known to the candidates, at least. And um, last but not least, I certainly would want to thank Tim King for being our moderator. So uh, let me tell you about Tim. Uh, he, first of all, uh, Maria Fruth was to have been our moderator, but she is in caregiver mode. So we are so blessed to have Tim come and join us this evening. And what did I do but leave my work? <laughs> I've been browsing to do, but not as well as we can on this. So uh, Tim is a resident of Roland Prairie. Uh, and many of you know him because he has been in the area now for a little bit. I think you might certainly call this home. I do. Which uh, we are very glad to know. But he retired after a 35-year career in education and administration from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he began as an elementary music teacher, uh, and then he went on to serve as the education director for the Louisville Symphony, and finally was the executive director for that uh, illustrious symphony. And while he was the executive director, the Louisville Orchestra was awarded the Leonard Bernstein Award from the League of American Orchestras, which recognized in one single orchestra in the United States that offers the most effective orchestra education program in the country. I think that's quite a feather in his cap. So uh, he comes to us now after having retired and in the Fort County he became the executive director for the Fort County Symphony. And then he is just in Dorage Workwick and a very um, educationally esteemed man. So we are glad to have him here. So in just a moment, I will invite him up, but I would like to help you know what the format is for these folks to unpick. Tim would introduce it, but the plans for the evening are that they will each have 30 and three minutes to get your background, what you aspire to see happen with the Fort Schools. Uh, and after that, Tim will be uh, giving some um, questions for each of them and for all of them at the same time. And then at some point, we will ask you that you have questions, and you will note there are microphones in the front. Thank you, Fran. Um, first of all, you, uh, you're going to notice immediately that I'm not from here. Everybody says, where are you from? I'm from Central Kentucky, um, and I moved here about 11 years ago. It was the best move I've ever made. I love it here in Fort County. Everyone's been so nice and so kind. Um, and so I really appreciate you being asked to do this tonight. Uh, we have five candidates for your report to the city school board, and they are from your left to right, uh, Jim Arnold, Monica Beatty, Maria Carpenter, Ed Gilliland, and Tucker King. And I want to go on and say that uh, there's no relation here, but that we know of them between us. There. So, um, uh, 
Mr. Arnold, I think we'll start with you with your three minutes and let, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tim, thank you very much. I, first of all, I want to thank uh, Fran for calling us and notifying your behalf. I think it's a great opportunity for us to, to be seen and heard and to kind of put a face with the voice. And so, so thank you so much for the invitation tonight. And thank you both for giving up your night tonight to uh, come, and, come and listen to us speak a little bit. Um, real quick on my background, I'm from Michigan City, Indiana. Graduated there. Uh, went to Valparaiso University after I completed four years in the United States Air Force. Went to Valparaiso University, went to Wayne Bay Family, going to school full time. Obtained my bachelor's degree there, raised a family, joined the Sheriff's Department in 1967. I spent 32 years on the Court County Sheriff's Department, eight years as your elected sheriff. And along with that, I served eight years in the Indiana State Senate, representing this district right here, four years as subject manager on uh, Highway Department, and past eight years I've been a member of the Fort County Community School Board. But what's more important is the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, I thoroughly enjoyed my career. I've been honored and blessed to serve the people of Fort County. I've had the opportunity to serve in a variety of offices, to do a variety of things and things that most people don't have the opportunity to, uh, to do, including meeting a lot of people that you see on TV. But that's not the main thing that we, we're here tonight. We're to, here tonight because I still have the desire, I still have the fire burning, and I still have the dedication and commitment to serve on the Fort County School Board. If I didn't believe me, it would have been a lot easier to say no, I'm not going to seek that. We have made some great changes in our Fort School system. Over the years, schools have taken a lot of flack from the public, from the politicians, and they haven't done their background, as far as I'm concerned, about what's been going on great things we've accomplished. We have a new superintendent, which we'll be talking about tonight, an absolute outstanding superintendent now, has committed herself to the betterment of the Fort schools and the programs they're in. We have a great school, is that one minute morning now? We have a great school board right now. Some of them have chosen not to seek election today, and one of them, Lee Dillon, is sitting out there right now, and Ron Despend has served a number of years on the board and chose not to seek election Main thing is this, folks. We're going to talk tonight about programs and our vision for the school. My vision is this. Whatever we do, the hard decisions we make, they aren't always popular. My, in my 35 years of elected office, they haven't been popular, but the main thing is this. It's the betterment of our community and the children that are in that school system. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Next, we have uh, Monica Beatty. Ms. Beatty? Thank you, Tim. I also would like to thank Fran for bringing us here this evening. My name is Monica Beatty, and I am a product of a report school system. In 1978, my mother moved my siblings and I to Laporte, Indiana. And upon moving there, we moved into the Laporte Pierce houses. And at the time, they didn't know if we were going to go to Hamley School or King's Parish School. And also, during that time, there was no transportation available to us. It was decided that we would go to Hanley School and we would have to walk a mile and a half to get to school. My mother and other single mothers band together and walked us a mile and a half to school in the winter months. And anybody that knows, in the 70s and 80s, it was really cold in Laporte. And because of her sacrifice and they picketed they interviewed with news anchors. They went to the school board, and eventually, we were afforded busing to the schools. When I heard of the school, got wind of the school closing of Kingsford Heights, my mind went back to 1978, when my mother had to walk us to school in the, in the cold weather. And I knew at that point that I needed to fight for my community. But aside that, fighting for my community. I also had to fight for the LaPorte Community School System because upon attending meetings and being given different reasons as to why our school was closing, there were some things that concerned me. I am an educated. Um, I graduated from Lacey University with a bachelor's degree in accounting. And upon hearing the deficiencies with the accounts, that caused concern for me. 
And at that point, I knew that the experience that I had at being an accounting manager and a revenue audit manager for 18 plus years, I felt that my experience was needed. My priorities for the LaPorte School Board would be term financial plans and to ensure financial transparency to the community. Open communication with the community, seeking input from stakeholders, build partnerships to foster strong connection between the school board and the community, ensuring physical and cyber safety for our children and our staff while they're with us and in our care. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Payton. Up next, we have Maria Carpenter. Ms. Carpenter. Well, I too want to echo my thanks to Fran and everybody that she has listed who's um, come in to volunteer their time to set this up for us. Uh, yes, my name is Maria Carpenter. My friends and family call me Rhea. Um, I married into LaPorte, so my husband's family has been here for around 40 years, I believe. He is a graduate of LaPorte High School. Uh, we are, have been married for almost 22 years, and we have two very young adult daughters, so we are at the beginning phases of our empty nest syndrome. My, um, my background is that I have a Bachelor of Science degree in business marketing, and I worked in that field until I gave birth to our first daughter. And currently, um, I have been substitute teaching for the Michigan City School District. So I have gotten into um, the classroom and been able to see um, what's happening and um, been able to talk to countless teachers there about some of their frustrations with administration or just the way things are done or what's happening in their classroom. As well, I, um, for three years, taught ESL online to kids in China. So I got to see a whole different school system and see um, the way things were done there and um, the focus of the kids, which gave me a unique perspective. So um, I have been involved with kids um, for many, many years. I am involved in children's ministry at my local church. And um, I have also been involved in a um, organization called First Steps um, locally here, which helps families in need. And this has given me um, some relationships here in the community that I really value and some perspective that I think is unique. Um, but what I wanted to see um, as a taxpayer, as a mom, as somebody who is currently substitute teaching, I want to see kids um, put down the electronics and I want to see them um, become a love of learners to um, embrace the learning and to become lifelong learners, because I think something that is not imparted enough to our kids is that you learn for the rest of your life. And so I want to come alongside the teachers with what they've been saying and with the administrators and um, get that kind of focus back to the kids, because I think it's invaluable for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Uh, next, we have Ed Gellerland. Mr. Gellerland. And thank you for this opportunity. We appreciate your efforts. And I'd also like to uh, wish the rest of the candidates the very best as, as this is moving forward. And I want to thank them for putting their name out there. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. And I appreciate the fact that uh, these four individuals, other individuals, have shown an interest in the education and support. Um, I've got 44 years. I'm on my 44th year involved in, in education, 16 as a teacher and a coach, 25 years as the Director of Athletics at Laporte High School, and I now work for the Indiana High School Athletic Association as an Associate Commissioner. I graduated from Laporte in 1977, um, married my wife Marie, and in 1978 graduated from Laporte. We both were involved in athletics here. She's obviously served on the board for a number of years now, three terms, and, and she's stepping down from that. Um, you know, I'm hoping that I can, can fill that position. We have three grown children that graduated from LaPorte, and I have grandchildren that are now attending LaPorte Community Schools. I've uh, got a lot invested in, in LaPorte Community Schools and in the community of LaPorte. I'm very passionate about it. I'm very invested in this, uh, this school corporation. Um, I want to see the very best out of our, our, our students at LaPorte and LaPorte Community Schools. Um, I would suggest to you that I, I want to see our schools attractive. I want to see the whole school corporation attractive to students. 
I want to see it attractive to employees. I want to see it attractive to the bus driver, to the custodians, to the maintenance people, to everybody that's employed. We've got to find a way to make this place attractive to, to bring people in that want to be part of the Fort Community School Corporation. We've also got to work at making it physically attractive. We've got some facilities that need some upgrades, but we've got to uh, make this an attractive school corporation that people want to attend. We don't want to lose our young people that want to attend other schools. We want to keep them here, that we want them to grow up and be a slice. That's what their goal is. That's the only thing I ever wanted to do when I was a little kid, was to grow up and be a slice. And that's what we need to get back to. We've got to set that as our goals. We've got to find the funds to be able to do those things, to, to make it so that people want to work here, they want to attend schools here, and this is the place they want to be. Again, as I, as I mentioned, um, I'm very passionate about the school corporation and the community. I love this community and I love the school corporation and I just want to be a part, part of helping it out. Thank you. Uh, rounding out our slate of candidates is Tucker King. Mr. King. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here. My name is Tucker King. I'm a third generation slicer, born and bred, and I'm running for the Fort Community School Corporation for three reasons. One, to improve communication with the community. Two, to provide quality education for all to enhance access to special programs such as trade and technology. I'm a graduate of LaPorte. I graduated in 2015. I went to Berkeley College of Social Work Conference for Environmental and Computer Science. I am married and I have a two-year-old daughter. I intend to raise her and all of my future children, God willing, as LaPorte Slicers. Today I stand before you a young man, I said really, a young man with an optimistic vision for the future, the future of our community. Together, we must cultivate sense of pride and community around our schools, a slice of pride that deeply resonates with our students. When they see a community that values their contribution, offers opportunities for growth, and fosters the environment of success, we are much more likely to see them stay in our schools and invest in their future here. The question we must ask ourselves is, how do we create that environment? First and foremost, we need to engage in meaningful community development opportunities in and around the schools. We must empower our young people to take ownership of their environment. This can be achieved through mentorship programs, internships, and hands-on projects. By giving them a seat at the table, we're not only investing in their futures, but inviting fresh perspectives that will change our future. We also need to celebrate the student successes and showcase the talent that's right here. Let's create platforms for our students to share their innovations and hard to create by spotlighting their achievements in academics, athletics, and extracurriculars, we can feel a sense of pride and belonging that encourages them to envision their futures here. Moreover, we must ensure that our institutions align with the needs of our local economy. By fostering partnerships with schools, businesses, and local government, we can enhance access to programs that lead directly to employment opportunities right here in the community. We must be proactive in developing the curricula that prepare our students Finally, let's engage in open dialogue. Listen to each other's ideas and concerns. When people feel heard and empowered, we are far more likely to contribute to the community that we love. In conclusion, the future of our community lies in the hands of our youth. By instilling pride, providing development opportunities, and creating an environment where they flourish, we can inspire a new generation to take on the challenges of tomorrow. When you vote for Tucker King, you are choosing to work together to build up our students, fostering an environment that our young people not only want to stay in, my name is Tucker King, and I ask you to vote for me this November for the Fort Community School Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Okay, now we're going to go into the question mode. Um, I have some questions um, for our five candidates, uh, and um, we're going to start for, with Mr. Arnold with question one, and then question two will be Ms. Beatty will start, question three, Ms. Carpenter will start, and we'll go down with that way. Uh, my first question for all five of you is, and we'll start with Mr. Arnold, uh, what do you feel is an important measure of student success? Well, I guess yesterday could be answered in several different ways. We could talk about you know, what they do to success after school, where, where, where they end up in their life, and so forth. But I think a measure of success is the people that have graduated from our community and stay in our community, decide to stay in the work and make it a better place to live instead of moving on. And I know that this has been a great discussion among a lot of people because we're losing so much great talent. We 
because of that, because of education, because of professionalism, and so forth. And I think the members of the Sassanian School System can be measured about those people just like up here today. The number of people that graduated before high school and are still here in the Fort School System. And that's what we want to do. We want to get those people educated. We want to let them pursue the, the uh, programs that they want, the careers they want. We want to encourage them to stay right here in our community and give back, just like all of us are doing here today. Great, thank you. I forgot to say, each candidate has one minute. I, I apologize, I should have said that before. I think you, you're under the minute, you're fine. You're, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure that we had that. Uh, Ms. Dave? Uh, the same, same question. What do you feel is an important measure of success? That's going to be the question for all, for all five of you. I think that an, an important measure of success is that when our children have completed their tenure in the LaPorte school system, they're able to go out in any community, any community and be successful. Of course, we would like for them to come back to our community <coughs> and blossom. But our main goal is for them to be productive citizens wherever they end up and that would measure the success of our school system. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter. I think that an important measure of success is um, being able to learn for themselves once they've completed the school and to be able to choose and to follow through on whether it's college or some sort of trade school or some other um, certification program that they are able to go on learning and to be able to equip themselves for those um, jobs or even relationships uh, down the road. I think success is a variety of things, but if the students aren't equipped to learn, then they're not going to be able to follow through on that. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. Well, just to kind of echo what everybody else has indicated, it's if when they leave LaPorte Community Schools, are they prepared for what's out there in the future? Are they going to be responsible citizens? Are they going to be productive citizens? Did we do our job as a school corporation to prepare them for whatever avenue they choose to go to? If they decide to go to college, they go into the workforce, did we do our job in the, the school corporation to prepare them for that? And if we see those kids moving forward, we see them graduate, they become successful, they're productive citizens, and I think we've done our job, and that's how I would measure success. Great, thank you, Mr. King. Question number two, have you ever participated in parent-teacher organizations? And please share any examples, and we'll start with Ms. Beatty. Have I ever shared? I have not. Participated in, in parent-teacher organizations. I have not participated in any parent-teacher organizations. I am a single mother that does not have any children, but I do have a strong de desire to see children succeed. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Um, I have had the um, experience of um, participating in um, our younger daughter decided to go to a private school for her high school, and so they had a parent-teacher um, association that I was involved in for the past year and a half as well. Um, I have been coaching um, different kinds of sports leagues for my kids, so um, that has allowed me to interact both with the teachers of the schools and the parents that were part of those organizations. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gilliland. As an athletic director of Port, we formed a community advisory group that we met. We did that for a number of years where we would bring what we felt were leaders in the community to come in and meet with the, with the athletic department and share their ideas, their thoughts, what their uh, vision for the athletic department was, uh, where they thought we were falling short, and I, and I would use that group. That's as close, other than being on the other end of a parent-teacher organization where I'm 
part of the teacher. I'm not the parent part of it, but I, other than that, that's, that's all I can find. Thank you, Mr. Keeney. Um, I have not yet had that experience. Question. Uh, the biggest budget items for the school corporation involve facilities. How do you feel the school board should go about facility planning? Ms. Carpenter. What? I'm sorry, did you not hear what I said? I heard your, and I did not chance to respond to questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Ms. Carpenter. Yes, yes. Here I talked to a round robin, I'm not following my own rules. There you go. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Arnold, sorry about that. I was very fortunate. I was very active at one time in Critchfield PTA and became president of the PTA at Critchfield Grade School. And Mr. Howes, for those older people out there, Mr. Ralph Howes was the principal. And I was president there. And uh, during uh, my term, I was serving uh, as, as a captain this year. But I organized with the Teachers Association at Boston Junior High School. Mr. Stricker was principal at that time. He set up a, a law enforcement class. I talked there for about six weeks. Okay, thank you. I apologize about that. I'll talk to you. <laughs> the next question, I'll, I'll repeat. The next question is, the biggest budget items for the school corporation involve facilities. How do you feel the school board should go about facility planning at this Carpenter Europe? So I believe it was at the last uh, school board meeting that I attended. Um, they had um, one of the chief um, building managers or custodians, um, I forget what his title was, um, come and show pictures of some of the things that they've done in the buildings and how they had used the money. So that was very interesting to watch um, how they were um, trying to both aesthetically and functionally change the buildings and the grounds to make it more um, appealing and more functional for the students and the faculty. So I would just um, continue that route of just the people who are there who are actually uh, working on the buildings and working in the buildings. I would want to get their input first and foremost to see what's needed, um, what is going to be effective, and um, what we can do with that money. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. There may be a need for a feasibility study of some sort to look at the facility to go through and determine where our biggest needs are and, and what needs to be determined, I believe. I, I know there was one done a number of years ago when I was still working at Laporte High School. Uh, that may be something we need to do again to determine where our biggest needs are and what, what facilities will need to be improved. Uh, I think I have a pretty good understanding of the school corporation and I have some ideas where I think it needs to be, but I think we need to have some uh, official that an outside group can, can come in and let us know what needs to be done. Uh, the, the biggest concern I have is the cost on where the funds gonna come from for this. And that's something that I, I have a concern about is how are we gonna fund this? It goes back to making our school corporation look attractive. Uh, not only from the standpoint of paying teachers and wanting people to be here, but our facilities have to have curb appeal. They need to look good. People need to come into our community and look at our school corporation and say, that's a place I want to send my kids. Thank you, Mr. King. I think that it's important that we provide facilities that are beautiful for our students, that beauty instills a, a sense of pride, instills a sense of pride, and it, it creates a space where people feel comfortable. Um, and one can aspire for more, I would say. Um, in particular, how do we respond to facility needs? I, as a part of my job, I, I work on long-term plans for, for capital budgets, um, engineering projects. I, I, I assist in scale projects can get done and I don't know enough about our budget yet but I hope that once I get elected that I will learn and help in any way I can. Thank you. Mr. Arnold. The feasibility studies are a very important part of, of school board you know, obligations and duties. Uh, we had one several years ago and if you think back that's what brought the impact center for high school into existence and also the, the uh, remodeling of Hamley School we just opened last year on the bus garage on uh, Boyd Boulevard. Those are the results of feasibility studies. 
We rely on those studies. As a matter of fact, the one that was given to us that uh, we had about, uh, about six years ago, uh, and I'm sure it's going to come up tonight, was Kiwanis Field Group included in that feasibility study. So they play a very important part of our obligations and duties. And uh, everybody just mentioned the financial aspect of the courses is, is a big drawback. Well, it's not going to change, folks. We're going to get into talk a little bit about, about finance and so forth with the school system. You know, and that's, that's, that's going to be a big deal. Ms. Bailey? When we begin to talk about big budget projects, first of all, I believe to find out what the priorities are. What position, what buildings are in the most need of updates? During the summer, they did do a lot of outside um, decorating and the yards look wonderful, they're amazing. But when we begin to talk about structures and how about systems, we need to find out where the priorities are and then go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, in your opinion, are LaPorte schools lagging on par or ahead of the curve in areas of equity and or inclusion? And I'll start with Mr. Gillibrand. You know, I have the opportunity to travel to a lot of schools with the position I have with the IHSA now. And what I find is a lot of the problems and, the, and concerns or issues that we're faced with in LaPorte are going on all I've been to, just since July 10th, I've been to 50 some schools. And when I go in and, and work with athletic administrators in those schools, I'm finding out they have the same thing. So I'm gonna suggest to you that LaPorte is at par in those areas. Um, there's always room for improvement in, in equity and inclusion. We can always do more. Uh, but at this point in time, I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. We're trying to do those things. And again, the issues that we're faced with here in LaPorte are, are, are issues say that I really I, I don't know what those facts on the ground are, but I'm willing to learn and, and, and find out more. Um, as far as equity and inclusion occur, I mean, to be meaningful, I, I do believe that it's important for us to offer the same opportunities to all of our students, regardless of their background. Mr. Arnold. Well, I think we can always do better no matter what the facilities and so forth, but equity and inclusion is, is a very, very important part of our, of our school issues as well. We want people to feel welcome in the board. We encourage them to apply for positions. We have job fairs. Yeah. We just had one here a few weeks ago, looking for bus drivers, looking for teachers, looking for specialized uh, uh, subject uh, matter and so forth. So, you know, if we can do better, I tell you, we have every reason to be proud of LaPorte because we don't turn anybody away. Everybody has a voice heard if they want to step up and be heard. Thank you, Miss Bailey. I think it's very, I think it's very advantageous of us to understand cultural differences. In the LaPorte community school system, we have 75% Caucasian, 2.7 African American. 15.5% Hispanic. I think it's very important that when our children enter into our schools that they see someone that looks like them. When children have a sense of, when they see someone that's able to um, relate to them, they feel a sense of trust in the community and a trust in the communities that they're around. So I do think that it's very important that we go outside of the boundaries of just our area to recruit teachers, EPAs, so that our children can feel safe in, in the environments that we put them in. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter. So I would also um, reiterate, I don't know enough about the other school districts to be able to say where we land, but what um, I do know is at the substituting in Michigan City School Districts is there's a different makeup of the students and the faculty there than there probably is here in LaPorte. 
Um, what I would encourage, though, is whoever, whether it be faculty or students, that we raise the bar and not come down to a certain level just because we think that we have a certain community in, within the school district. But I would encourage our faculty and our students to raise the bar of education and always be striving to be better. Thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, in your opinion, do you feel it is important for school board members to be in the classrooms? If so, how do you feel that should happen? And if not, please explain why you feel that way. Mr. King. I think it's important that school board members have access to the schools and be able to see what occurs every day. I mean, we, it's, it would be impossible for us to make informed decisions without being able to witness what occurs. Um, I, I think that it doesn't necessarily need to be unguided access, but I, I believe that without the opportunity for us to survey Mr. Arnold. Thank you. Well, several years ago, I began a program on my own. For me, there's a new school report for the school system twice a year. It is very successful because I have an opportunity to walk through with the principal and look if I can pick up information about you know what's good, what's bad, but see what's actually going on in the classroom and observe it. And also, our school board president sitting right over here right now, and he's doing the same thing as well, going out and making sure that our, we are visible accessible and accountable to the teachers. If they want to talk to us, we're there. So I think it's very important, extremely important, that they're in. But here's the situation, folks. Let's not forget that I'm a special case. I'm retired. This is my full-time job. The other people on the school board, most of them have jobs. They can't get away like I can. So don't criticize them. They still have to fund, you know, they don't have to bring home a bacon so they can feed the family. So I do that, but I know that they all talk all taught would love to go into schools more often than they can. So Ryan and myself have been doing that for the last couple of years. Thank you. Ms. Peggy. I do believe that um, our community, our school communities need to see us in the community, in the schools, at this after school programs. We do need to be visible at some point. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, I think that um, having substitute taught, um, I get a very unique perspective and I get to talk to the teachers one-on-one. -on -one. I also get to see it um, firsthand, what is going on in the classroom. So I think it's invaluable to understanding um, not just the dollars and the accounting or the fixing of the buildings, but how this is going to end up impacting both the faculty and the students. Okay, Mr. Gilliland. I certainly think it's very important. I wouldn't want to underestimate how important it is for not only school board members, but administration to go into the buildings. And I always enjoy when we'd have a school board member or somebody stop in to see me at the high school. Usually Jim wanted something, but um, <laughs> I mean, other than that, it was pretty nice to have him come in and, and talk to me about what was going on in the athletics. And, and I think those teachers appreciate that. I think they appreciate you being in the building and, and knowing that you care. So I think it's very, very important that we get out, not only to the schools, but be visible. Go to the choir concerts, go to the athletic events, go to wherever, whatever activities are going on, try to be as visible as you possibly can. Like Jim said, he's got all the time in the world. My schedule is pretty flexible, and Marie wants me out of the house, so I can get to those things during the day. So, um, you know, that's something I would enjoy doing, and I know that the administrators at the schools value that visit from school board members and, and the central office administration. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. How can the school board help improve test scores? Mr. Arnold, test scores. How can the school board help improve test scores? Well, first of all, I want to give them a pass out kudos to Dr. Kahn, who is uh, more or less the head of, of the, uh, the school system right now, and the assistant superintendent, and done a magnificent job. Now, how can the school affect it? Let me tell you something. The teachers need more credit, more support than what they're getting. When you stop to think in our schools, when you see some of these little kids, 
What did they learn? A zip up their pants, a button their shirts, or say thank you or please. They learned it from school teachers. They're not getting the credit they deserve. And that's why it's important that we support these school teachers. They're doing the best job they can and don't get the credit they deserve. So how can we improve it? By supporting the school teachers. Not criticizing them, but supporting them. You sure you wouldn't go out and criticize your doctor in some prognosis they made for you. Why do we find it so easy to criticize the teaching that your teachers in our school system? These people are professionals, they taught you went out to school, got educated for that, and they're doing a great job in that school. So what we can do to improve it is make sure that they have the proper finances and the proper equipment to carry out their job. Ms. Baby. I would have to 100% agree with what Jen has said. We need to be able to support our teachers in the classroom. Great. Uh, Ms. Carpenter. I think that we need to look at the actual tests that we're using and see whether or not they are um, a good um, gauge of what the kids are learning and how they're learning. I think we also need to look at how often we test and at what age we start testing and whether or not that's really fruitful. Um, I think that we also need to um, just encourage a lot of reading and just um, grounding them in um, vocabulary, going back to the basics, and getting our teachers to encourage their students to do that as well. <coughs> Mr. Gilliland? Well, I think if you looked at the paper to kind of echo what Jim said, um, Ben Tonico had a, a, there was a nice article about how our test scores and the I read were, were up because I think they put some innovative programs in. I think they're doing some things to try to reach out to these kids, identify those, those kids at an early age that are struggling and provide opportunities for them to get better. We kind of just got to stay out of their way and trust those people to do their job. We've got to hire, and again, I hate to go back to the same term, but we've got to make our school corporation attractive so that we're getting the best teachers we're getting the best administrators in here we can, and let them do their job. Be supportive of the innovative programs that they're wanting to come up with. Think outside the box. Uh, think of doing things different. We've got to let them do that. That's what they're trained to do. And, and trust them and support them. Uh, provide them the, the, the equipment, the, the whatever they need in order to do their job and do it effectively. And Mr. King. Yeah. I echo what everyone else has said, I guess. To, to improve test scores, I think it's important first, though, that we, we make a decision, our decisions based off of what is best for the children. We have to look at what programs are successful, like you highlighted, not Mr. Tonagle's success at bringing up our high-range scores. Um, and, and we need to find the, the barriers that are causing our test scores to come down to some extent and try to remove them as much as possible. I think prioritizing budgets so that the programs that are successful are, are consistently funded is probably number Okay, um, next question. Um, do you feel the school corporation is in a healthy financial situation? Ms. Baby. As I stated previously, um, when I started first attending the school board meetings, I was concerned financially for our school board um, without knowing in depth of where we stand right now. Um, I cannot effectively answer that question, but I do see that there are some, some deficits there that need to be addressed. I did review the last audit that was submitted to the State Board of Accounts, and that is concerning. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Carpenter? Um, I know that the budget was created. They were talking um, at one of the last couple of meetings. Um, I know that they're buying a bunch of school buses and they're trying to update those. Um, so I know there's a lot of costs that are coming down that um, we need to really take a look at. But um, I think really we need to be wise as the school board with managing the money and making sure that it's um, going to the best thing that we can possibly do. Mr. Gilliland? 
I, I'm not privy to the, all of the information that I need to be able to answer that question, you know, 100% accurately. What I can, I believe I can, I can say that would be accurate is that we can continue on with the status quo of what we've got now. Our concern is how are we going to finance some of the improvements that we need to make and some of the things outside the normal operations of what we're doing now. Our enrollment's down a few more kids again this year, and every time we lose a kid, we lose some funding. So we need to, again, make our, our school corporation attractive, bring, bring students in, people that want to be here, and then our funding will return. But we're going to have to also think of alternatives for our funding. We can't get everything done, whether it's facilities or pay raises, for the for the uh, the employees of the school corporation in whatever area they're at, whether it's the, whether it's the teachers, whether it's the bus drivers, whether it's boosters, whatever it may be, it's going to be difficult to fund those in our present financial situation. I think, and then give them and make us competitive with the other school corporations in the area. Okay, Mr. King. So, from my understanding. Mr. Arnold. Well, I think under the whole discussion as a school board and the school system, you can very hopeful that we're going to be able to pay our bills and the financial and our sound. But let me tell you, we are. Do we make some cuts? And we like that our, our budget. We need to not need to cut that. We were able to get everyone in the school system across the board to pay leave this year. Financially, we're still solid. I can tell you this, the State Board of Accounts. After we heard this issue about school shortages just last year, the State Board of Accounts had to met with them and worked out our budget through Dr. Hunt and, and so many others. The State Board of Accounts went back and checked the Fort Community School System records back in 2016 and gave us a clean bill of health and said we're fine. Now, could we use more money? Absolutely. Are we at the point where we can be a little concerned? Absolutely. But it's not the school system's fault. We're not getting the money downstate because of student enrollment. That's where it really started to hurt us. Next year, we're, we're really concerned. So as far as the, the financial services now, we're in good shape. We're going to make it this year, or we wouldn't give them a pay raise. I have one more question before we open it up to our audience for your questions. And my last question uh, for our candidates is, in light of issues of violence in schools across our country, what steps do you believe the school board might take to provide a higher degree of protection, or do you feel the corporation is doing an adequate job? Ms. Carpenter, you're first. Not at the end, it was a big one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I saved it for last, that's what I think. Mean. I know that, um, the Michigan City High School had, um, somebody posted something a couple weeks ago, and so they had an hour delay because they were checking all the bags, and the students were not allowed to um, leave the back, take the bags into the classroom because of that. And then they adjusted the schedules for the rest of the week and kept the no bag in the classroom policy. So I think part of what the school board needs to do is um, just talk to the uh, superintendents and the principals and the administrators about if something comes up, how are we going to handle this? And really just have that plan in place because it can't be an afterthought or it can't be a, hey, let's get together and meet on this. It's gotta be something that's already settled and decided on so that it can be implemented quickly. Thank you. Mr. Gilliland? Again, the, the when I visit other schools, what we're doing at the port is, is, is consistent with what I see throughout the state. Um, some schools are a little, uh, a little more stringent um, in the sense that they've got some metal detectors when we go to, to, to 
to that buddy events that I may visit, and they may have to go through some of those. I don't think we're to that point. I'm not sure that you can ever be 100% guarantee that you're going to be a safe school. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, and I, I'll give you a for instance that was always a concern of mine, is we're really in pretty good shape during the school day, but those doors at, at 3 o'clock when those kids go on to the high school, now we've got so many activities going on after school. And that's a time that worries me and has always worried me as an athletic director. And are we going to be prepared for that? We think we have been, uh, but that's always a challenge. It's a challenge everywhere. I think we are doing, we're consistent with what everybody else is doing throughout the state. Um, I think we're, we're on par with what we should be doing. Um, but again, it's something that is a concern all the time. And we've, we've had drills. We do the things that are necessary to try to protect our students. And, and uh, I'm sure they're going to continue to do Mr. King. Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, going back to what I said previously, we have to put the children first. And what is good for their health and safety? I think that you can always find ways to improve security. I think it seems like the high school's done a really good job with the improvements that they've had to school. Um, from what I saw at that pile in elementary school, their principal has done security extremely like high end of speed with regard to you know, the, the, the way that they're checking in and checking out. It seems like it's that way. Mr. Arnold? Well, I just said what a sad state of affairs it is. Ten years ago, this guy had to put police officers in the schools every time. Our kids want to get educated, the kids want to teach, and we got to put police officers in our schools. But it's a fact of life, and it's here to stay. Now, I would suggest and encourage you folks to pay attention to the survey that Dr. Woods and your office put together and sent out. The one question on there was about weapon detection. Whether we want weapon detection in our school system. The results of that survey will be back, I think, on uh, that board meeting, we're going to discuss it. And from what we understand, overwhelmingly people are in agreement. Yes, they want to see that. You've already moved somewhat forward with Fort High School. We just put a brand new security entrance in the high school as you come in there. So we're moving. We're moving along with that, trying to do the best we can. Uh, so uh, can we, all, we can always do better. We can always do better, but you know, with just the time and the fact that we live in today, we're going to have to continue to monitor the, uh, the going on nationwide and hope it doesn't happen to us. Okay, thank you. Ms. I think that we are moving in the right direction and even talking and having a conversation of school safety. Um, as Mr. Arnold, Arnold said, unfortunately, we're at a point where our children's protection is and should be our number one priority. And the school corporation has started making those changes. And um, Dr. Wood did send out the survey. If you've not filled that survey out, send it back in. It's important that community has participation within the school board. If we do not have participation from the community, then we're, we're left to make those decisions on our own. Again, Tell everyone we know, fill out the survey, send it back in. That is the only way that we'll know and we can communicate to get those changes made. Great, thank you all. Thank you all so much. It's very informative. I've, I've really enjoyed hearing it. I think we're so fortunate to have these five people running for school board. And I'm just, just I'm very impressed. Thank you. And now I'm going to open it up um, to you. Um, if you have a question, uh, we have microphones down here. Um, your question can uh, any form of a question, not a statement. Uh, so we need a question. It can either be directed to one candidate, or you can you can uh, let them know that you would like for all the candidates to respond. So uh, just please come forward if you'd like to do so. I think we have one right now. Hello, I have two questions. And this is be for everyone. The first question um, you asked in the very beginning: um, How can you determine the success of your children? And I think the school board plays a part in that. 
but not the parents' part. I think the parents play probably even a bigger part than what the school board plays. So as you can see tonight, we don't have a lot of parents here. So how as a school board can you get the parents involved? Great question. Uh, actually, we'll start with Mr. Gilwood. <laughs> oh, sorry. You are up next. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a good question. I think you're spot on that parental involvement is crucial. And I think if you look at any statistic any, anywhere around that would show that those parents that are involved in their kids' education, the chances for those kids to be, those students to be successful is much greater. How we get parents, uh, there's a lot on parents' plates. We've got uh, many broken families. We've got uh, both parents working to get them involved it is a difficult thing. And I think that's a challenge. I think we need to, we need to reach out to our administration and say, what ideas do you have? And trust that those people that are the experts, how can we get you involved? Uh, how can we get those parents involved more? I think it's a very valid point and a very good question. And I just want to clarify, you didn't want all the candidates to respond, is that correct? Yes. Okay, Mr. Mr. King. So, I know I stated in my opening speech, I think it's important that we, we build a, a community around the ownership of, of, of the school system. I mean, students need to feel empowered, but along with that, the parents as well. That parent involvement was huge in all of the athletics I took place in and all of the, the, the extracurriculars without the parent were, you can't have the success when you buy into everybody. Um, and as I stated, I mean, my number one goal is to increase communication, but along with that, Community involvement. I think, I think uh, it's a good idea that I, I kind of wanted to bring forward to be either monthly or, or, or quarterly at town hall meetings where outside of a board, like a school board meeting, we have the ability for parents to come and talk to us and ask us questions, get direct answers, and, and you know, make their voice heard and feel empowered to make those decisions. Great. Um, Mr. Arnold. That's a great question. You know, and if you can figure that out, I'd like to know the answer. I think that's right. <laughs> You know, think our school board meetings. We're like if we have three, four people come to our school board meeting. Unless, unless they change coaches or hire a new coach, and then they come out and see what you have. I've never noticed that. But when it comes to school programs, when it comes to discipline in schools and so forth, nobody comes to the school board and discusses them. Now we have a three minute public comment before that, and that's not a question and answer period. But, We'll all try to be accessible and accountable. I have no problem with people calling me when we get on the side and talk about it, other than school board meetings and so forth. I encourage it. If I'm going to ask for your vote, I'm going to make myself accessible to you. I can rest assured. Thank you. Ms. Baby? I think it's very important that we as a school board make the community feel like we are valued and that their opinion, opinions matter. And the reason why I say that is because I've gone to five school board meetings and not one time has a school board member approached me now what if i had been a parent scoping out the corporation to bring my my son or daughter there i um i sat back and i waited to see if anybody would approach me and nobody did i would go early and nobody approached me so i feel like it's very important that when we invite community in, and we invite parents in, that we make them feel like they're valued. Make them feel like their opinion matters. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter? I'm not sure that the school board has a lot of interaction with the parents, um, like others have said, unless they come to the school board meetings. So um, if we did want to interact and um, involve ourselves with the parents, we would probably have to go to those events. I think um, it's probably better as a school board to interact more with the teachers because the teachers are really the ones who are doing dealing with the students on a daily basis and contacting the parents and trying to have that relationship with the parents. Um, I agree with what everybody said. It's hard with a lot of um, single parents, a lot of um, kids going to different homes on different weekends you know, to get those parents involved and have communication. So I would just try to see if, um, as a school board member, I can go to those events and introduce myself to the parents 
And then secondly, and probably more of my focus would be on talking to the teachers and seeing how uh, we can communicate better and get more involved with the parents. Thank you. Ma'am, I think you said you had a second question. Yes. And my second and last question is for Maria. When they asked the question about diversity and inclusion, and your answer was, we need to raise the bar. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So I think that um, we have a tendency to um, you know, compare ourselves to other schools where we say, oh, we have a bunch of kids who are low poverty, or, um, you know, we have a, maybe um, a lot of girls or a lot of kids in this um, ethnic background, and therefore um, we have a certain bar with that. But I really believe that if we are teaching our kids to learn, to really um, grasp the fundamentals of learning. You know, when I was growing up, it was called the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, even though the last one is an R, or the second one either. But I think just going back to those basics and not saying this is the community and therefore, you know, we just have this standard, but really trying to elevate the students and the teachers in the community to, um, as I said, to be success is going to be going out and whatever they want to tackle down the road, they're going to have the, um, the fundamental education background and foundation to do that. Okay, thank you. I would like to uh, comment, please. Oh, absolutely. I feel like that um, to say that when your child is being bullied because of who they are, it's important for them to have someone that they feel like they can talk to. And then when we talk about diversity, we really need to have someone that our children are able to go to. We're living in a day and age where children are being bullied because of the color of their skin, the way they speak. Um, in the city of LaPorte, we, times are changing. It, it's not like it was when it, in the 1970s. Um, I was out this weekend and while I was out, I heard three, di three different languages while I was out. What are we telling our children that are different by not accommodating them for their needs? I think it's very important that we look at that issue and try to make changes for them. As we've said before, <laughs> the children are our future. And if we're not preparing them for the future, then what are we doing? Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Anybody write anything Tim, down? Tim, Tim, can I say something? Oh, absolutely, Mr. Arnold. Kind of just uh, to remind the people at the school board meeting, and, and what Monica brings up a good point, and what Max, who I did see you, I, I'll ask you maybe, but for a short. In the sense of the school board, I mean, I should tell you, when you come to a meeting, we generally have an executive session where nobody's allowed there. Then we have a work session where anybody can come into a work session and her can't talk to people that are her. So if you'd come to the work session or come to the meeting ahead of time and not feel you're going to be there, during our break, we would probably, we would probably have time for conversation. But oftentimes, we finish one session at two minutes to six and then we turn right around and the president has to wrap the meeting up because it's on TV, we have to get in order. So, you know, just reach out a little bit to us and let us know you want to talk to us after the meeting, before the meeting, or whatever. Because I don't want anybody to come to that meeting and feel you're being slighted. Again, if I'm going to ask for your vote, I'm going to be respectful to you and I'm going to be accepted to you as well. I want to make sure that I'm available to you. Thank you. Uh, and yes, ma'am. Um, hi, this question is for everyone. Um, I've been in education for over 20 years, 17 was in the court. My question deals with equity. The majority of our families in LaPorte are no longer two-parent, mom stays at home to raise the family. More and more grandparents are raising their grandchildren for various reasons. Being that these grandparents are one to two generations apart from their grandchild, how do each of you propose to close that gap between the grandparents and the grandchild's teacher, the principal, and admin. 
um, especially on the realm of technology. If you're two generations removed, your grandkids are rarely staying home. We have, we both don't think of clue how to monitor it or how to help them with their homework. And also money. The two, the grandparents that are raising their grandchildren are already retired, most of them, on a fixed income. And when it comes to equity, can our teachers ask for money for projects, et cetera? These grandparents don't have money to give, like possibly keeping our house. And um, what do you propose that would make the grandparents feel valued? Um, studies are showing in the board, um, and studies I've done myself, the grandparent doesn't feel valued um, when they go to talk to the teacher or to the principal because of their age. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. King, we're going to start with you. So, I, I think the first and foremost, it's important that parents and caregivers both, and I agree with you, not just grandparents, uncles, aunts, I think it takes a village really to, to raise children. And, and we, I think that we need to remove any kind of, uh, the word, I guess, conversation now, but, prejudice when it comes to who is showing up for the, the child as long as the child has someone there who cares. I mean, that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if it's a parent or, or a grandparent. And so you show that as long as there's someone in their life that cares and gives them the time um, to, to help bridge that gap. And I think we've already been working on it. I think mentorship programs are another option that school, schools can give kids more advanced of in having, um, even if they don't have a, a great home life, if they have a mentor who really cares take that time to learn about them and, and help them find a, a path to themselves. I think that's another, it does show that that's another option for children to, 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 to see more success. Um, <coughs> as I stated previously, parts of the board are, are, are well below the poverty line. And it, it, it's hard for us to expect people who are you know, just roughing it, trying to make ends meet to, to be able to donate and give that, that spare possible, I would like to hopefully lean on community organizations to help us find programs that can help those people out. Mr. Arbor? I'm not sure I didn't understand the question. You're asking how we close the gap between the grandparents and the, the financial? Well, um, I, I did not mention that kids that are being raised by their grandparents for various reasons are usually are, have experienced trauma. So those kids learn differently. So they come into the school already different, having been through trauma, to be placed with their grandparent. And sometimes the teachers don't know how to teach that kind of a student, or the, or the admin, the higher-ups don't understand that that child does need to be taught differently. And the grandparents are usually one to two generations older, and they sometimes feel that they're not taken seriously because they're seen as old and far removed. Well, all I can say is there's a, there's a number of agencies that can be contacted with a situation like that. And you may not like this answer, but it's not the school board. It's not the school board's responsibility. After bringing it to my attention, my, my job is to, to refer you to the proper agency, and not to just you know, handle it. That's why we have counselors and so forth that specialize in training. We have a number of agencies that help. We have child advocates in the board. Some people like that to look into that, you know, and, and uh, so I, I think I fully understand what you're saying, but uh, I have to just be honest with you, it's not the school board's responsibility. I'll refer to you if you come and ask me and help you all I can, yes, but it's not the school board's responsibility. Then let me um, throw it back to you. Whose responsibility is it to train the teachers or the principals or the admin to understand that they that there is a difference? Well, what, what then, mean? then then coming from a two parent home. I'm not I'm not really hearing everything you're saying. Okay. I may have to excuse you. I'm, no, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. You know, all I say is if you can come to me, I know who to send you to. I can refer to all the parents, <clears throat> or the grandparent or the kid, and, and the child itself can, can be uh, be addressed. But uh, fully supportive of that, you know, absolutely. And what you're bringing up now. I've heard a number of those cases, and, and, and 
where the grandchild, the grandparents are raising the child, they don't have the, the money and so forth, and running into financial difficulties. So we, I fully, you know, Congress that and it's very receptive to try to accept that. We can be free. Okay, Ms. Bailey. I think that what I would advise would be to um, maybe seek out assistance and just going to the school and having a meeting and discussing it because maybe they can provide some extra assistance for you that is not just readily, readily available. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's definitely a tough situation as uh, Mr. King stated, it takes a village. And my mother was fortunate enough to have a village. It def it's hard, my mother was a single parent and without the village, you need a village. If it's a mentorship program, something to stand in the gap for the stuff that is missing, you might want to reach out to that. A Boys and Girls Club, some other associations that may be able to help you. Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, I, I agree um, also um, that I think there's layers, and so I, I don't want the school board to um, overstep an area that should really be what the teacher is doing, or maybe the faculty. I know there's paraprofessionals in the school system that deal directly with kids that go to the classroom that help them, and so I don't want to come in and you know um, do anything that would um, disrupt that which is already in place. What I would say is if there's something specific, like you had mentioned with technology, and I know, you know, I'm getting older and I didn't grow up with it. And thankfully I have young kids that can help me with that. But maybe, you know, we can put something into place where we have the high schoolers volunteer time at the elementary school. Grandparents can come in with their phones or sit on the computer with the high schooler and we can do this in three seconds flat. Something like that, but I, I would be cautious to say anything definitive because I don't think that's the school board um, is something that we're going to do directly. I think it's something that we're going to encourage the teachers to do, the faculty, the professionals, the counselors that are there that know the students and know the grandparents. Mr. Yellow, you mentioned you've been in education here in La Porte for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your service La Porte You're very School welcome. Corporation. Um, I, I agree with what was said here that I'm not sure that the, direct, that the school board would have a direct connection to that. However, I would tell you the challenge is identifying those kids that need the help. Kids are, kids are proud, the students are proud, and they don't always want to step forward and say they're having problems. And trust me, I can relate to the technology problems. I'm a grandfather, so I can relate to those technology problems. But I can share with you when Tucker was a football player, of course, at Fort High School, if he didn't have a, a pair of cleats, he probably wouldn't have come to us and told us that, but we would have discovered that. We would have found a pair of cleats for him. And I think our teachers and our educators and our administrators, if they can identify those challenges, there are people that will help with it. It's just identifying those students that are struggling because maybe they are being raised by grandparents that we don't, we don't know about. But as a board, I think we've got to defer that down to the to the grassroots, I guess, at the building level. Okay, thank you. One more quick question. Indiana um, has passed the new law, the DOB, in regard to I read. Can retention after in third grade, if after they take it a couple times with summer school, et cetera, they are going to be retained. Any opinion on that at all from anyone? I, do you want everyone to answer that? Sure, they have Okay, sure. Mr. Arnold, we'll start with you. Well, I'm not going to, again, I, I agree with the question. I don't know if you're talking to close to night, I'm not sure. What was the answer? Go ahead. Well, um, the state has passed that the I read, second graders are going to start taking I read, and in third grade, if they fail in second grade, they will take it in third grade. If they fail in third grade, there's interventions, there's summer school, et cetera. If they fail again, they are to be retained in third grade. So opinion, if anyone has one about that. Well, that, that's, a, that's a huge thing on the State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. That's big for them. So that's where all the, all the knowledge is coming from down here, supposedly. You know. 
Um, I just did agree. And I'd have to leave those people that made those decisions, those people, teachers like yourself that did the deal with that, you're more knowledgeable about that than I am. You know? But we see that about the teens and kids. Back when I was in school, back, you know, when you go outside by the school, I'll go all the way. Just, you know. Back when I was in school, you know, the aim or, or flanking, as they called it, flanking was just, you know, kind of an accepted practice. Not like it today, we're moving kids along that don't aren't functioning, that are you know, not, they're not getting the skills they needed. And you know, unfortunately, look what we're putting out in some of these schools. You know, unfortunately, we're doing that. So there has to be some kind of measures taken to make sure these kids get proper education. What it is, I don't know. Maybe it's the vocational training. And I'm big on vocational training, believe me. So Ms. Bailey. I would um, have to um, say that I'm not familiar with the law, so I will not comment on that. Thanks. Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, I, I would um, say again, obviously if it's something mandated by the state, then we're going to have to implement that. Whether or not it's the best thing to do, I'm not sure. Um, you know, my kids really love reading, but they kind of went through spurts of it. So, and that's a kind of young um, grade level to be doing that. So um, I would be very cautious of it. And again, earlier I had said, you know, testing doesn't always show what um, a child is learning or where they're at. And they could end up having a spurt where all of a sudden they get math or they get reading or they accelerate the whole grade level. Um, so, you know, we have to look at is the testing really effective and is it really gonna show what we need to, you know, see in that student. Mr. Gilliland. I too am not familiar with that law, but I would suggest to you if that's the law and that's what we're being told we have to do, that that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah. Whether we agree with it or disagree with it, um, I do like the idea of some sort of level of mastery before we move students on. But again, if that's going to be what we're told we have to do, then that's what we're going to have to do. Mr. King. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have time for one more question before we have our closing comments. And I think we have someone coming up right now. So I just want to say that my question is, I graduated in 1992. And back in 1992, before high school was a powerhouse in the Doolin Conference in athletics. I'm noticing a decline in our athletics. And I'm wondering, and I'm not here to um, I don't want to say anything negative about our coaches. I appreciate each and every coach that comes out to work with our children. However, I wonder if anyone has any ideas of how to rebuild our programs and to get our skill sets back up so that the court can become a powerhouse in the Dublin Conference once again. Okay. Um, let's start off with 
start or you, I think it's you. I do, Mr. King. No, Mr. King started last time, I think. I, I think it's you. <laughs> Mr. Arnold, I think it's you. Well, I fully understand where you're coming from. And ironically, I had a great discussion today. I had it last weekend, and I had it two weeks ago with the, uh, about the inclusion, but student inclusion, about the, the sports program. And you're right on. Uh, there's a variety of things we need to look at. Number one is, uh, since you graduated, we have a couple schools that have BAC, that are community schools, that are drawing, that are drawing players from all over. And I'm surprised because the voucher program and the school of choice didn't come up today. Because if I was now in the state, this was one of the things we were worried about. But to pass this, these high schools were going to start doing the same thing colleges do, going out and recruiting people to come to their school to play athletics. And I think we're getting, we're seeing results of some of that today. Some of the schools that are in our conference are twice as large as the port. Twice as large. And they're drawing from all over. But port isn't doing that. No. Now, what do we do? I think our coaches are, are good. Our coaches are well-meaning people. They're very well trained. They're, they're knowledgeable about the sport they're training you know, in. They're just not getting the kids up. Why? I have my brother, you know. One part of the technology thing. Kids are too worried about driving the car and too wrapped up in the social media and so forth. And worry about that, you know. Back when we were in school, it was a problem fact playing a play. That was something you, you died for to make the athletic team. Nowadays it's not doesn't seem like it's important it was, except some of those schools west of the border that are doing with recruiting and so forth. So I think that it's a we need to look at hard look at that the program. We may even have hard look at Conference and we need to have our conferences to get back playing schools of our caliber instead of playing people over our heads. So I think that's our time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to keep it to a minute if we can. Miss Baby? I, I think that we have to not only look at what has happened to our athletic departments, but also take a look at why are our students leaving our school district and ask the question. What are the weaknesses there? And where do we need to strengthen our school system to build back up again? Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. I think that um, coaches and faculty are um, all you know, good things to um, have a depth of and um, you know, a good knowledge of and not just putting somebody into that position it's open and we need somebody in there. I'd be curious um, why you want to get back to that. You called it a powerhouse kind of status. What what about that um, you found um, intriguing or um, good for our community? I Yeah, I kind of agree. I've seen a lot of the kids just automatically go to their phones and so I don't know that sports is as valued and I think so there might be um, kids who might have a real talent for it, who are just not going out for the sport for various reasons. So I don't have a lot to say about, you know, how we could get back to that, but I definitely think that we always need to um, try to recruit the best, um, both the student athletes and have a high expectation of them as students as well as athletes, and um, a pride for the school and a, um, you know, a, um, cheering for those um, athletes in all the various sports and not just the popular ones, as well as the coaching staff and the parents who are volunteering. Mr. Gilbert. There is no way I can answer this question in one minute. <laughs> I've, we're I've we're got, for time. I've, I've got a, a, lot, a lot of thoughts on this and I would certainly love to share those thoughts, but let me just share one statistic with you. And I, I certainly don't want to to be critical of Mayor Dermody by all by all means, but this is more of a this is as much a community problem as it is a school problem. Let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about with the social economics. We have eight schools in the Dumas Athletic Conference. We keep an all sports standings for both female and male sports. There's a direct correlation between free and reduced lunch rates and where those teams or where those schools finish in all those all sports standings. You're going to have Lake Central, Crown Point, Chester, and Balfour are going to be in the top half every year. They're going to be in the top half in male and female sports. 
the bottom half will have a part about fifth, maybe sometimes sixth, and then you'll have Portage, Michigan City, and Maryville. The four schools at the bottom are also the same four that have the highest free and reduced lunch rates. And the ones at the top are the lowest free and reduced lunch rates. There's a direct correlation between social economics and the success of athletic programs, your performing arts, your academics. There's a lot more to it than just, and, and, and we've seen a change in, in our, our, our community in some of those things. Do I think we're gonna rebound? I certainly do. I think this community is heading in the right direction. I gotta make up for Mayor Germany just a little bit now because <laughs> uh, I slammed a little bit. But no, I think we're heading in the right direction. But this is a bigger problem than just the school corporation. We've got to attract people into our community and provide opportunities. You go to Valpo, you go to Crown Point, look at their facilities compared to ours. Their kids have better opportunities than what our kids have got right now. So how do we fix that? I don't have those answers right now. Um, I would tell you one of my biggest, I told you I didn't have enough time. One of the biggest concerns I've got is the, the influence of youth sports. I think that is harder for high school coaches and high schools to deal with than name image likeness and, and the portal. What is going on at youth level before they even get to the high school is maybe why our numbers are dropping down. You know, they have a bad experience as a 10th grader in baseball. We've got a grandson that fits into that that mold, he had a bad experience in baseball over the summer, he may not go out for baseball again. So what is going on before they even get to us is having an impact. But I'm, like I said, I just don't have enough time to answer that. Even five minutes, sorry. Thank you. Mr. King. So, you know, as, as the, the last team to go to state for football, um, just a yeah. shout out, yeah. Um, <laughs> the only? Yeah, one and only. I stated it previously, we needed to create a culture of success. It, we were with, like, we were a winner mentality. That's just the, the, the slicer the slicer mentality. It was, um, it was helpful, and there was a community that was around it. And you would go to a game, you would have to jostle for a seat, and you'd have to fight people to, to stay in the spot you wanted to stay in. My, you know, I remember my aunt and always being in the stands right, right below the, uh, the press box, and that was our spot, you know? So it, it's important for us to. And like I said, I don't know the, the direct answer, but it's important for us to, to give back to having a community that's centered around our schools. I mean, we're, we're a small enough town, and a lot of these small towns, the only thing they have is the school. And, and I mean, we're lucky to have some, some other amenities, but our school is such a large part. It's the only shared institution that we all have, that, that we all have in common. And it's important for us to, to be successful because it, it, it sports are the heart and soul of it. Something that gives us all pride. And I mean, if you look at these EAC schools, they're, they're paying their coaches at least $100,000 a year. And you know, it might be an access to, to, to budget problem, but I mean, I think it's twofold. And I, I think that it's important for us to devote more of our attention to it and, and, and more of our budget to, to making sure that our, our, our students are safe. Okay, we're going to take uh, one, one more question audience, and I'm only going to give you 30 seconds. Okay. And then after that, uh, each candidate will have one minute to make a summary. Uh, and this last question is, um, how can you as a school board get the students more involved with the report community? Ms. Carpenter? I think maybe, um, and people have mentioned um, funding, you know, when um, single parents and their grandparents can't afford it, maybe um, we can have a program where if students volunteer a certain number of hours, then, you know, we can um, discount the cost for the Chromebook rentals or, you know, if they're in athletics, we can do something for the uniforms. Some, some of those costs can be offset by them volunteering in the community. Um, that would be my suggestion. Okay. Mr. Gilliland, 30 seconds. Well, I think this is a great opportunity for athletic teams to reach out and, and wear their jerseys and do things for the community. I, I, that's obviously where I'm centered more than anything else, but it could be any club or organization to go out and volunteer to do things. Um, that could also be part of, and we had this at one time, I think we kind of got away from it. It was a requirement of the coaches to find one community service project to do uh, as part of their requirements for their jobs. So uh, as part of their evaluation. So there's some things that we can encourage, but again, I don't know that that's a school board's responsibility other than to 
suggest that to the FI director. Thank you. Mr. King. Um, as I stated previously, I think that partnerships with community organizations, the local governments, and businesses are all important parts of this approach. I think those are things that we can champion as school board members. I, in my personal, I mean, I guess professional life, I, I, I'm pushing for student liaison to the sustainability commission for the city of LaPorte, um, and also working on a, a tree grant that we've received for the, for the city of LaPorte that has a component that is a, a jobs program for children, and I think it's important for us, specifically for high school age for children, I should say. And it's important for us to, to create those bridges between the local government, the businesses, and, and the communities, the organizations, so that students have, you know, job experience and placement here and, and become members of our community, contributing members of our community. Mr. Arnold? Well, I think that uh, there are a number of organizations now, and uh, not only the Fort Bragg, the county and the state, that are asking for school kids to get involved here and serve on their committees, on their boards and so forth, just for the knowledge they bring. They bring. So I encourage that. Plus, we have so many, uh, Ed alluded to, we have so many organizations in the, in the uh, schools that are volunteering and going out and doing great things, not getting enough publicity and notification or other requests in media for, for going out and doing great things. I think we have to continue to uh, encourage them to, to stay on track and encourage some of our young people to get involved in social activities as well in our classrooms. Thank you. Ms. Bailey? I think the encouragement first has to come from the parents. We have to encourage our children to be involved. And so many times it's just easier to not have them involved because for children to be involved, parents have to be involved. So we first have to get our parents into the notion that being involved an idle mind is wasteful or an un idle mind, I can't remember the phrase, <laughs> but I think we need to get our parents involved and then in turn our children will also be involved. Thank you. We're going to end this evening uh, with a one minute statement from each of our candidates as their summary um, for their candidacy for the school board. And we will start with Mr. Gilliland. Thank you. Um, and again, thanks Grant for this opportunity tonight. Thank you for moderating this. Well, it was my pleasure. Um, prior to being hired by the IHSA as the Associate Commissioner, I served on the board for two plus terms before I retired from my job as FI Director. The board for the IHSA is very similar to what the school board is here. We have three responsibilities. We hired a commissioner, we took care of policies and procedures, and we took care of finances. And that's what the role of the school board would be too, is we hire a superintendent, we, we look over the finances, and we approve policies and procedures. Uh, so I've been involved in that. The one big difference is we, we were in charge of 150,000 students when I was part of the IHSA board. Um, it's a big organization, but I look at this as being very parallel, and the decisions that we had to make and, and what we had to do there were very, very similar for student athletes as, as it would be for just the students in school. So I've got experience in this. I mentioned to you before, I bleed orange and black. I love this community. I love the school corporation. I've got a lot invested in this, this uh, organization, so I would like to give something back. Thank you. Mr. King? I, I think that it's important for people to remember that it takes young people taking, taking uh, the reins on things sometimes. I'm not saying that we have it bad or anything. I'm saying that the future is in the hands of our youth, and it's important for us to, to have young people take a step forward, and you know, I, 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 I preach that all the time, but I, I'm trying to put it in practice here. I, I, I think that I have the drive and the spirit to, to do what it takes to make the right decisions, and I have the energy now. Um, I, I have the motivation as well. I have a two-year-old daughter who will be a slicer, and I, I want to make sure that these schools are a place that I want to send my daughter. And so at the end of the day, you know, I, 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 I talked about improving communication, providing access to education for all and, and enhancing programs, but a, a big part of that is, you know, I, I want the board to be a place that I feel comfortable sending my daughter and, and you know, my future children. And if I start doing that now, I, I think having access to that would, would, would allow me to grow into a, a board member that can make a difference. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arnold. First of all, thank you, Mrs. Myron, and Jim, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you people for sitting through and listening to us tonight. Uh, I'm a very 
very proud member, senior member of the Milwaukee School Board. I've served with some great people. I've got to serve hopefully with some great people that I asked the coach to hear. If I don't, the opportunities are presented to me and the honor to keep store upon me, I'm forever thankful for it. Together, we can make a difference. We've had some successes, we've had some failures. But you know what? The still sun's never going to come up in the east tomorrow and set in the west. We've got to learn to work through these things and do it together. And we're not going to do it by criticism, by getting on social media and whacking certain people and complaining and so forth. Before you do that, you need to, do, you need to uh, learn the facts of what's going on. We have a great school system. It's going to be even greater. I'm surprised that the situation didn't come up tonight. I've talked about vouchers for charter schools. I was ready for that one. <laughs> but the fact remains is, stick with it. We have great administration. We have great teachers. We have great bus drivers. We have a great school board. And they're all geared toward making this a better community and making the best we can for our students. So I want to thank you very much. Thank you to the other committee for everything you've done for, for Jim Arnold and the staff. Thank you. Ms. Bailey? My goal is to support a strong, collaborative education environment that ensures every student has the resources and opportunities they need to succeed. I believe in fostering transparent communication between the board, parents, teachers, EPS professionals, and the community while prioritizing the safety, well-being, and academic growth of our students. I will contribute to making the school the best that they can be for everyone. I'm asking you tonight to vote for me, Monica Bailey. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter? Yes, I echo um, everyone's uh, gratitude for this forum and for you coming out and for asking the questions um, and getting to hear a little bit about the concerns of the community. I think, you know, our school systems are the foundation of, you know, what the community is going to be in the future. Um, what we're putting out, um, what we are teaching our kids, what we are valuing. And um, I look forward to being a part of that. If you vote for me, I will work hard to ensure that the schools continue to raise those standards and to lay that foundation to strengthen our community in the future. Thank you. Well, finally, I would like to say thank you to all of you who came out tonight. Um, and I learned a lot tonight myself. So uh, being a transplant um, here to, to the LaPorte area, and I, I feel very fortunate that we have five individuals who care so much about this community and about the school system uh, that we're going to have really good representation. So thank you five so much for being here tonight. <laughs> Okay. I echo thank you. Just to remind you, be aware that sometime next week we will have access to this broadcast, this video, and therefore you can send that information to whomever you feel would like to also be informed as a voter. Um, just remember, there are only three slots, and we have five excellent candidates here. So this is giving you and myself a lot of food for thought. I'm, I'm just thrilled that we have this kind of level of candidates. So thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. And I'm so proud of your fellow portion. I'm, I'm sorry, are you saying, is it, where is it going to be available? Uh, Hometown News uh, Now is a Facebook place. It also is a website. Uh, and I will make sure I try and access as much of the social media as I can to give a link for how that will be able to be accessed. And I will give a heads up to uh, Stan Maddox to help us get that news out as well. But give it about five to seven days to get all the editing done. We have enough time uh, for voting to get good information out. Thank you.